Before we get started with today's show, I wanted to tell you about another great ESPN podcast, 30 for 30 podcast. 30 for 30 is back with season eight, Heavy Metals Inside the Caroli Gymnastics Empire. It's a groundbreaking seven-part podcast series that takes listeners on a deep dive into the lives and influence of Bella and Marta Caroli, the most successful and controversial coaches in USA Gymnastics history. It's available now, so be sure to check it out. You can download and subscribe to 30 for 30 podcast now, as well as the right time wherever you get your podcasts. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcasts. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. Uh, Coming up on this episode of The Right Time, we're going to talk about that NBA bubble. going to reflect on the life of John Lewis and also your voicemails on terrible talent shows. But first... All right, Gabe, uh, it seems that the NFL and the players are coming closer to figuring out how it is that they are going to get this whole training camp thing going. Uh, The NFL players over the weekend had a very effective social media campaign, hashtag we want to play. And what you wound up with was a bunch of players, many of whom you are familiar with because they led with the stars saying like, yo, we want to play. But the NFL is not taking the steps that are necessary. They were saying the NFL were not even listening to their own experts in order to figure out what was best for getting everybody back on the field. But now we're hearing there's going to be zero preseason games. That appears to be it. They're saying that the NFL offered zero preseason games, but Georgia Tyler, the NFLPA, makes the point that's basically in the NFL's discretion. So like they made that call. They decided it. Uh, The Players Association, at least at the high level, seems to be striking a bit of a conciliatory tone with the NFL saying, hey, we're all in this together. And the point that the union makes that I think is very important is that starting the season is far less important than finishing the season. The most important thing for them to do is to finish the season. And now I think this has been interesting for the NFLPA because, look, every time something comes up with collective bargaining, we talk about this. The NFLPA is in a different situation than the players in the other leagues that play in this country just because there's so much variance in the interest and conditions of the players, right? You got four different classes of players. The way I put it is you got superstar quarterbacks, you got quarterbacks, you got like star players, and then you got everybody else. Right. And they're playing completely different games. They're making different levels of money. They got different risk factors, all of these things. And so it's very difficult for you to get something going with NFL players that everybody can get down with because the structure doesn't put them in a position to be but so unified. COVID-19 fixed that, though, because the thing that they all have are families. Right. Whether it be the family that lives in their houses, it could be the family back at the crib, whatever it is. But they've all got families. And that became a bit of an equalizer. And even the guys who don't have families know that the other guys do have families. And there's a distinct possibility that those families are nasty. It is entirely possible that those families, when they go home, they out here just being wild, reckless with it, going places they not supposed to, not washing their hands like the man told us that we need to wash their hands, all that stuff. The cooties abound, ladies and gentlemen. The cooties are everywhere. We know that the cooties are everywhere. And look, the cooties, I have to tell you this, Gabe, in New York, the cooties ain't out there like they used to be, right? Like I saw the numbers. They done got this curve a lot flatter in New York. And I still ain't trying to go outside and interact with the people. You're in Connecticut. I think you've seen your local numbers. They done got that thing a whole lot flatter. You seen that? It's a consequence of having it hit first, right? Well, I think I think it's a consequence of hitting it first. And we took it dead serious when it hit first. But at the same time, it's hitting these other places later. And they're still not taking it seriously. You know, like I really think that just once it got here, We went hard. Like everybody was like, okay, well, this is what we got to do. And then it wound up being largely effective. But everywhere else that we look at, man, the cooties out here running these streets Texas, Florida, Georgia, Arizona, California's even getting cracking again. You seen that? Rallies down in Huntington Beach. You're restricting our freedoms and all that nonsense. You and you know anything about Huntington Beach? Oh, I know everything about. You know, Huntington you know everything about Huntington Beach. Did I tell you this? That uh, my good buddy Jim Rome, love Jim to death, right? Jim is honestly one of the best people I've come across in this industry. But when we used to do Jim Rome is burning, his operation is out of Orange County, and so it always puts you up in a very nice hotel in Orange County. Like it might be a resort, 
in Newport Beach or whatever. But the first time I went, they put me up in a boutique hotel in downtown Huntington Beach. And I don't remember exactly what happened when I learned how Huntington Beach got down. But I was like, oh, I'm not picking the Huntington Beach Hotel again. <laughs> no. Huntington Beach also neighbors Long Beach. Yes. You're going to have the juxtaposition there. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. But yeah, no, that Huntington Beach, I was like, oh, I didn't know that this was the state of affairs here in Huntington Beach. For those of you who don't know, it's a bit of a white supremacist hotbed. Like that's, that's, is it, this the skinheads. Like that's, that's, that's they, that's they territory. That's where they got it cracking is out there. But they out here, man. Like the cooties is just out here taking over at every turn. This is what we got. And the players, the NBA has a bubble and we keep talking about the bubble and we kind of like find it interesting as an idea, just, you know, the, the social experiment, like basically this being big brother, but the big thing about the bubble, and I think it's obvious, but still easy to forget in the course of general conversation, the bubbles there to stop who's coming in and stop who's going out. And these players have made the call that they're going to stay away from their families and all of this stuff. And they're going to be behind those walls. That's not what's happening with the NFL. You know what I mean? It's not, these guys are going back home. They're going to be with their families. It is entirely possible that some of these people are going to be sending their kids back to school, right? Because people are really trying to make that happen. The other thing that we have to remember is not everybody is taking this thing as seriously as other people are. So there's some cats that while everybody's in the meeting talking about, I'm afraid I'm going to get sick. There's some cats in the back not saying a word that are thinking to themselves, well, actually, I believe this whole thing to be a hoax. Like, that's the thing with baseball. You know, uh, Joe West, cowboy, the umpire that everybody hates, who has come out and said that he believes that this whole thing is a hoax. You know that man ain't doing the things that he need to do. You know that man ain't doing the things that he's supposed to do. And I tell you this, maybe this is just Joe West's plan to get people not to argue with him. You know what I mean? He's like, yo, I, yo, I might have it because that's the life I'm out here living. But that's where NFL players work. And so I know they had a conference call a few days ago where they're trying to figure this out. And it's a wide range of opinions of where they were coming from. But by and large, they overwhelmingly felt like the NFL was not doing what they needed to do to make sure and ensure their safety. And the one thing the league seems to have come around on, I saw Dan Graziano had reported this, is daily testing for the first two weeks. And then if the positive rate goes down below 5%, then they'll slow down on the testing, but daily testing for the first two weeks. And nobody wants to endure the testing, especially if they're doing like the, the dig up in your nose test. You know what I mean? Like nobody really wants any parts of that, but it's necessary. Here's the thing about testing. Those tests aren't free. And those tests aren't really cheap. So I was talking to somebody about this, and the number they threw out there for a test was like $175, right? So let's say that the tests are in the ballpark of $175. To make the math as easy as possible, maybe let's just call it $150, okay? So let's say the tests are $150. A training cap roster is what, like 90 people? Let's just say we're talking about 90 people, because even if we're not talking about that, you add coaches and everything else, so forth and so on. Let's say we talk about 90 people. 90 people at $150 the test it would have been a lot easier if you said 100 people. You know what? Great call, Gabe. You are correct. So it's 100 people. So 15 Gs because we're going 150. Okay. Every day to test. Every day. Right? Now, are costs offset by insurance there? I don't know, but I would imagine whatever insurance policy they had did not account for this because that's part of what's going on here is so much paperwork and so many things that people had signed had never considered this possibility. Trust me. I know. OK, they had not considered this possibility before you sign a new contract. Don't you worry. They thinking about it. The, the, the math has been done. The lessons have been learned. Right. But they had not thought about this prior. Like we, like we were just really poorly prepared for something that honestly was foreseeable. It was not foreseeable necessarily it was going to be this thing, but it was foreseeable that it was going to be a thing. So I don't know what that is. But what I do know is. All these tests cost money. And it sounds like the owners didn't want to pay the money. Like it sounds like they're trying to find a way to not have to test that often. And honestly, as much as the players want to demand the test, after a few days of it, they're going to get tired of it. Like it's just not a process that is enjoyable. It's something that people really want to go through. But I want to make this point about the NFL because I want to be fair to them to some extent, okay? 
a lot of people have come out and said something that I think was like, it's a fairly reasonable thing to say, which is that the NFL has had four months to come up with something and they still don't have anything. Right. And people think that all they've been doing is kicking the can down the road, waiting and seeing, waiting and seeing. And now they're here. And oh my goodness, they don't have a plan. I do believe that they should have had more of a plan. Like, I think that some of these things shouldn't have been matters of negotiation. And I think it is very telling, and it says a lot about the NFL, that some of these things had to be negotiated. Never forget to quote from Tex Schramm, former general manager, or the guy who used to run the Cowboys. And I can't remember if he said this during the 82 strike or the 87 strike, but the legendary line was, we're the ranchers and you're the cattle. Right. We're the ranchers, you're the cattle. That's how they see this. That's how they see these players. And so the idea of looking out for their health and safety is a secondary concern, which is really bizarre because you can't do this without healthy players. Like healthy players are the thing that matter more than anything else in making this league go. You cannot do this with healthy players, but it sounds like they didn't want to spend the money to test. And it's not like you can just snap your fingers and make it all better. Or like you're making that analogy for with Tex Schramm with the cattle, you know, yeah. a lot of parallels with factory farming that are getting sick. Yes. The people who run those things just think, all right, well, I can make it all better by injecting these cows with some antibiotics. Yes. Just like you've been giving your players pain meds. Right. To get through these games. Yes. You can't just, hey, Woo. <laughs> yeah. Give you a quick shot and COVID-19, you know, cooties are gone. Yes. Not happening. And I think that there's a long run concern that the league needs to have that I just haven't seen discussed enough, which is it is possible that playing in the midst of this pandemic could set the NFL back for literally a decade. Because what we have to remember is that this disease appears to attack the lungs and the heart. And it appears that the damage that can be done is lasting. It is long-term damage. It is not something that is going to go away. And I saw people making the point on Twitter, and this is a good one, that what is often the difference between an elite athlete and one who's just kind of good is lung capacity. You know, it's like lung capacity is the strength of your heart. Like, I think I saw something once about John Havlicek before he died about how they had found out that one thing John Havlicek had was like a bigger heart, like literal heart. Like, not, 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 not like he a white dude playing basketball heart. I mean, like the one that pumps in his chest that actually got blood in it. You know what I'm saying? That he had the big, like one of the biggest hearts that anybody had. And so if your heart and your lungs are damaged in ways that have like long-term issues, yo, man. What happens if Mahomes gets this? You know what I mean? What happens if Lamar Jackson gets this? What happens if Saquon Barkley gets this? If Julio Jones gets this? Whatever it is. Or let's start like start naming the star players and start naming the young guys or the guys whose names you don't know right now, but you might know later because they're going to improve. Like you could be affecting the quality of the labor force by putting them in a position to contract this disease. And I get what the financial consequences are of this for everybody. And when I say everybody, that's right. I'm talking about me too. I mean, this thing is big. This thing is huge. If you don't have football money, I saw a story on NJ.com in New Jersey. They say if they don't play this year, Rutgers football looking at losing $50 million and it might be twice that for a place like Ohio State. Like based on looking at the numbers and what the money was from 2019. These are the things that they're talking about that could be the case. These television networks, like the one I work for and everybody else, we put football games on television and make profits off of them. You know, we talk about football and we make profit off of that. Like the stakes are sky high if there is no football to be played. So I fully understand why the league wants to play football by a hook or crook. But man, if you wind up getting significant numbers of your players sick doing this, folks got to understand that this is not just simply a matter of you catch it, you shake it off, and then you're back in the game. That's not necessarily what the deal is going to be. And that's before we start talking about these old dudes coaching. 
as before we start talking about these fat dudes blocking, the consequences of what could happen to me seem like they could have real long-term effects on the quality of play in the NFL. We could lose some players that are supposed to be linchpins for this from here on out. Like, Gabe, you know how the quarterback got a red jersey in practice? If I'm a team, you got to put the quarterback in his own isolation, right? According to the same premise, yo, Pat Mahomes would not be having a single conversation with anybody else on the team if I was running the Chiefs. None whatsoever. He in his own place, yo, what's going on with Pat? Oh, yeah, um, he's still waiting on the paperwork to come through on his contract, but he'll be out here, like, after it's done. He ain't coming nowhere near practice. He ain't coming nowhere near camp. Why? For what? What, to develop timing with Tyreek Hill? What timing they need to develop? You go run faster than everybody else, and I'm going to go throw the ball farther than anybody else. Touchdown. What we need what, 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 we, what we need to work on? What are you, crazy? Tom Brady, old ass. Tom Brady, 43 years old. People shouldn't be around Tom Brady as it is. Like, I love my parents to death. My parents are old. I got no idea when the next time is that I'm going to go see my parents. And I'm not saying Tom Brady is as old as my parents, but I'm saying he will be soon. It won't be long before he's as old as my parents. And I know he believed that he got the secret. You know, I know that he believes that all this avocado ice cream and all that he's been over there eating and all this stuff he's doing. I know he believed he's straight. He good. How do you think the players feel on the other end of this? What would it take for the players to just be like, all right, we're okay. We're going to come back next season. The way to get things like this shelved and everybody Mm -hmm. to kind of just accept it is if there was like this like large scale bailout. There can't be any football this year. We're going to offset your losses, that sort of thing. But then a lot of players, you know, they're going to lose that year of their career, right? I think they are less concerned with losing that year of their careers than they are about losing that year of them checks. So if they got the check, you think, I think that if they, people yeah, would yeah, be yeah, okay yeah, with yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me ask you a question. If they were like, yo, you gotta, we got to open up and come back to the office. But if you don't go, you still going to get these checks. You go to the office. And that ain't even in the face of COVID. <laughs> I, I'd be down there in Barbados. But the difference is, though, is that like you can keep doing this thing for a long time. Yes. Whereas these players can't keep doing this right. thing for a long time. Right, 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 right. But if they get the checks, the problem with not being able to do it for a long time is you cannot get checks for a long time. I understand that some people love what they do and they would like to self-actualize and put themselves in a position of greatness. But if they tell them boys, we'll give you them checks. OK, then that's cool then that's what, that's what it's going to be. The issue that the players have as a unit, though, is, and I've been reading about this, Mike Florio's been making a lot of good points on this, is as a separation between the cast that's got guaranteed money and the cast that don't have guaranteed money. That's a huge part of this. Not everybody can afford to play it safe. That's why I say if they were like, yo, we'll get the checks, everybody will come out here. But some dudes need this money, man. And some people, as scared as they are, the same way that there's people out here in these streets and these people that I've been seeing who, like, it will break my heart every time I see somebody get on the subway. And, of course, in the last three or four weeks. Because I know damn well those people ain't getting on the subway because they want to. They're getting on that subway because they have to. Because they got to go get that money. This is the way they get their money. They got to go out there and they got to go get that money. You know what I mean? Like, I get that and I understand it. And a lot of these players are in the same situation. I don't think people understand this. And I know it's going to sound crazy to hear me say this but this is the truth most football players don't really make a lot of money okay it seems like they make a lot of money but they don't really make that much money and so let me let me put this into context for you so i think the minimum salary is somewhere around five hundred thousand dollars a year in the nfl okay now i know that most people hear this And unless you live in like New York or the Bay, you're like, oh my God, $500,000, right? That'll change my life. And it'll certainly make your life better. But I think you're thinking about making $500,000 in the context of a person who has already got whatever their living situation is going to be. They've already got a car. Like they've got stuff already. Not all their things and everything they're dreaming of, but you've already kind of got some things, right? Like, I mean- I'm guessing that most people who are listening to this assume that I make more than $500,000 a year, right? And I can tell you that when I first started making in the neighborhood of $500,000 a year, don't get me wrong, my house was nicer than it had ever been before, right? Like I was, I was, like I was doing all right, but I was like a single man. I did not have children. I was living in a state with no income tax, all of those things. So I was able to live nice, 
but I was still in the process of getting actual security. Because when you're making a lot of money is when you got that like security. But let me tell you what else, else I didn't have, aside from kids, a family that expected anything from me. Like I have never had to cut my parents or my siblings or my cousins or anybody a check that I was not 100% willing to do. Like I never had to do that. If I were to get drafted into the NFL, my first thought would not be I'm going to buy my parents a house. My parents got a house. You know, like I don't have to think about these things. Nobody's responsible for me in that way. The way y'all think of $500,000 as being all the money in the world, all these guys' families think about that $500,000 as being all the money in the world. And most guys in the league are making around the minimum. Like I'm not talking about the super high echelon of players. I'm talking about like the rank and file guys. And so missing out on $500,000 a year, most of them are simply not in a position to do that. Their lives have not put them in a place where they could save enough money to be able to go through a year at the lifestyle that they've been living while making $500,000 a year. And your thought is, well, okay, yeah, well, you know, you can just, you know, maybe you shouldn't have got that car. Maybe you shouldn't have got that house. Yo, man, you a football player. You just can't be out here living around everybody. You know, you six foot five, 275 pounds. You can't be out here driving a Civic. You just can't, you know, like, like, like these are the things that come up with these cats. And so the idea of missing out on a year of income that they cannot easily replace. They can't just go out here and get like some other job that's going to put them in the same situation. Like they, they're not as rich as you think. And I'm not asking you to necessarily sympathize with them or anything like that. But I just need you to understand that most players in the league are crossing their fingers and hoping to get to a second contract because the second contract is when the money might come. And one of the reasons you'll see guys who don't want the season canceled is it will delay for a year their opportunity to get to a second contract. You know, like those things are real. But for the dudes that have not gotten to the second contract, a lot of them are going to have to risk their lives in order to get their bread. You know, there's a lot of them that got no other way to really make money. They got no other way to get this done. And look, these players have to be looking up in Texas high school football is not going to happen. I saw in Southern California, the football is not going to happen. We got all these places that we can look around and everybody is shutting this down. And in those places, the kids are more important than the money. It's not like that in the pros, in part because of collective bargaining. But the money's more important than the players. And I feel for the players, even if they get everything right. Like I've been talking to cats at different levels of football in this. Even if they get everything right, I don't think it's possible. And that's why I cut the NFL a certain measure of slack on this because I don't know if it is possible. I know that people around this have been led to believe they thought by July everything was going to be all right. Like they thought July was going to come, that we were returning into the world, and that we would be on an upward trajectory that would get us to September. And that simply has not happened. That simply is not the case. That is just not where we are. And so they're going to come out here and they're going to try. I hope they can get it done, right? I have a personal interest in hoping they can get it done. I have no reason to hope that they can't. I just got a little bit too much common sense. And sorry, guys, I don't see it happening. Goodyear believes that movement drives us forward, that every mile brings us one step closer to our goals. But Goodyear also believes in the importance of a rest stop and taking a breather to pause and reflect on the road ahead. Sometimes that's all we need to keep going, a moment to compose ourselves before we start moving forward again. So as you get ready to start moving again, Goodyear's here to help. Visit Goodyear.com to learn more. Goodyear, more driven. All right, now, while I don't see the NFL thing happening, Gabe, did you see that uh, they, they got the, the COVID test results back from the bubble? I think they said they tested, what, 346 people and nobody had it? Not only the NBA bubble, but also the MLS bubble is totally locked tight now. Oh, really? So they actually they got that one team out of there? FC Cootie? Y'all got to go. Get y'all nasty asses up out of here. We can't have this, right? And so they got them out of there. And look, if the NBA has got this bubble straight, then cool, let's play some basketball. I'm doing my best in this day and age not to legitimize what I consider to be people acting in bad faith. Like, I think that's just something that we generally have to stop doing. I made a mistake with it yesterday with that guy who sent that tweet about Mark Cuban and the kneeling or whatever. That guy was operating in bad faith. Like, I I just don't want to acknowledge people who are operating in bad faith. However, I do want to bring up the folks. And I think that there's a significant number of people who somehow believe that there's just like this rabid leftist group of sports writers who they just don't want the sports to happen. Like we're rooting against sports. 
we're rooting for these things not to go on. And yo, what would I get out of that? Yeah, it's just so unfair, man. Yeah. Like you honestly think that an NBA writer wouldn't want to go do their <laughs> job and cover games? Right. How about this? Like, forget about doing it. How about simply having your job? We all would like to have our jobs. We all would, right? I don't know anybody who's sincerely rooting against getting back to action. The problem that we've got, and this is just a general American problem that we have to look at and ask ourselves how we got to where we are. How in the world did science become a left-right issue? You know what I mean? Like, like adhering and trusting scientists became an issue of the left-right divide. Like, that's what's so wild about it. And everything that I feel like I've been reading from scientists gives pause, right? It gives a level of apprehension. But bless the NBA, because they did have a plan, and they did come up with this. And Gabe, I think you could vouch for this, that every step of the way that I've said that the NBA has earned a measure of our trust, and that they seem to be taking every step possible to make this happen. Like, the problem with the NFL and with the players was, they did not feel like the league was taking every step possible for which the league should be ashamed. Like if it gets to a point that something like this happens and the players look at you and say, we can't trust you, then you've done something terribly wrong along the way. Like there's no way around this. I believe now the NBA obviously is not beyond reproach on this matter, but I think that the way that they handled things off the rip earned them a measure of trust. And I think that they came up with a plan and credit, like somebody needs a raise for this, right? But they seem to come up with a plan that may not be foolproof but I think it's going to be pretty effective. And they can get this thing going, then we will have basketball, and I am really looking forward to it, even though I have forgotten everything I knew about the basketball season. Everything at all. I barely remember who's good. I don't know who the eight seed is anywhere. I, 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 I'm going to have to do a lot of work to try to catch up and remember what the hell was going on in the NBA. What's funny about it is, I mean, like, yeah, the Lakers were a prohibitive favorite, but it kind of feels like since everything got locked down and we were trying to get things gassed up with a bubble. They just kind of became the favorite because he's LeBron. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which I have no problem with. Right? <laughs> but it's just kind of like, oh yeah, the Lakers are going to wrap this thing up in about two and a half, three weeks. Okay, we're good. Like overwhelmingly the best team in the league was Milwaukee this year. And people are trying to discount them and say that the <laughs> Heat are going to win it. <laughs> <laughs> like we well, just Cortez is running the damn ticker. Oh, well, well, yes, exactly. Like we have just oh, Cortez is so ready for this, but Cortez is right. They have what might be Giannis Kryptonite. They got Bam. If you have a guy that can guard Giannis one on one, you'll beat the Bucks. He is the only player I can think of outside of maybe Kawhi Leonard, who's both quick enough and strong enough to guard him. Like what Giannis can't do with Bam is just duck his shoulder and muscle him out the way. And what he can't do is just like outlong him, basically. Like if like the, the reason that the Heat have such a good chance is because of Adebayo. There's there's no way around that. That's the only thing I remember about the NBA season, though. I feel like they played against each other right before the <laughs> locked down. And that's all I got. I have no idea what any of this is going to be. I did think it was interesting. Did you see that where the league apparently sent a memo out to the dudes and they were like, yo. Start wearing your mask and dress appropriately when room service comes around. Play the music. Thank you for your patience. A representative from the right time will be with you shortly. Your current hold time is 15 seconds. All I'm saying is this, people were telling me when that first came out, and I said that second part jumped out, the part about dressing appropriately really jumped out. And people were like, well, they're probably talking about PPE. I'm like, no, they're not talking about PPE. If they were talking about PPE, they would have mentioned that when they mentioned the mask. Like they put a comma and put together a whole nother thought. What did bubble going to look like in like three weeks? I have no idea. Right? Like there's going to be a whole lot that's going on in there as that happens. But right now they've got it figured out. They have it. We're going to have a basketball season. Assuming these guys don't kill each other 
while they're playing ping pong and all these other games that they are engaging in around the properties? Have you been paying attention at all the reindeer games that the dudes are out there playing? I've been kind of getting annoyed at all the damn pictures I see of people fishing. <laughs> are these players all catching the same fish just over and over again and then tossing it back? Yes. And I don't think those fish were there before the bubble. I feel very confident that they have set the game to rookie mode. Like these cats out here catching fish in the middle of the afternoon. That's not how fishing works. So they out here getting a fish on. I seen cats playing what they call it, pickleball. I had never heard of that. Playing some game called spike ball. I saw Boban was engaged in that one. And look, man, cats are mad competitive. I want to see these unofficial boot ray tournaments that these dudes have. But somebody's going to lead a bubble with nothing. All this is is a big old team flight, except every team is on the flight, you know? Did you see the barbershop? I did see the barbershop. So I got some intel about the barbershop. So apparently it was highly competitive to be the barber. All these dudes have their own barbers. And so there's jockeying behind the scenes to get your barber onto the list of guys that's cutting hair, right? Like something tells me LeBron's barber has made it. Right. Like like whoever his barber is, is a guy that's going to wind up being in the bubble. But there's some dude that's like a big star player who's like, how come I can't get my barber? Like, what's going on here? Do they have a white dude or are they understanding that the black dudes could cut the white dude's hair? And then suddenly these white dudes are going to have better haircuts than they've ever had before. Boban going to have a fresher haircut than ever. I'm surprised that Tobias Harris never took Boban to his own barber anyway. You know what I'm saying? What they said, though, is that if you wanted to get in to the barbershop as a barber, the big thing you needed to be able to do was braid hair. Basically, the barbers who could cut and who could braid were like 3 and D guys. You know what I'm saying? They're like dudes who could protect the rim and stretch the floor. It's like the survival of the fittest type of thing. Yes, because only but so many people can get in. And so if you could braid, you went to the top of the list of the barbers. Man, man, this is like eliminating the five and going yes. going stretch five. Yes, yes. The modern all- game. If, you're, if <laughs> your game isn't tight, <laughs> if you can't braid, sorry, man. Yes, you're the new Roy Hibbert. Good luck right? in the Euro League. Yep, yep, yep. Except they don't want that either. They they started as gangster, right? Like they started the front base at five. Like they, but this is these are the fascinating things about getting this populated, as I know. That there was a, and I need to know who in the NBA office, whose job it was to vet and decide who the barbers were going to be. And what was the background check like on the barbers? Oh, yeah. We all know, we all know where a lot of dudes learn how to cut hair. And it wasn't in a traditional barber college. They went to, shall we say, the Malcolm X barber college well then the other layer to it as well is if there's only going to be a couple of different barbers and they're not necessarily your barber are they going to have out like the little book on the coffee table these are all the types of cuts that you can get will there be a chart yeah because at black barbershops it's the chart that there's a poster on the wall and they got numbers by all the haircuts exactly yeah is there going to be a chart in the barbershop i also want to know What's it going to be like the first time the following sound is heard from the barber? Ooh. (laughs) That first time. That first time. Like, let LeBron's barber take a bite out of crime on the back of somebody's neck. Why you say that? Oh, no, no, no. That's cool. I can can fix it. You can fix it. Is PG going to get a fresh cut from LeBron's barber? Look, you can't go get a cut from whoever it is that they can get a cut from. Can you imagine Kawhi telling him he wants the usual? (laughs) because <laughs> you know he's got his own pattern of communication with his own barber he goes up in there and he's got to actually it's one of those times when you have to like step outside of your comfort zone yeah. and really it's, describe and be on it about what nah, you want except the thing about Kawhi is because he doesn't do anything adventurous with his braids all he got to do is sit down somebody that has never met Kawhi litter before knows what needs to be done with his straight backs just holds up a photo of himself. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Apple time. No, this, like I say, there's, there's so much that's going on. By the way, I have no idea when they're talking about actually playing games. Do you? No, it's not. It's not, <laughs> it's not exactly important, is it? Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> John Lewis passed away on, I believe it was Friday night, but it was over the weekend. And I worry 
and I think it's possible for a lot of you, that John Lewis is a person whose name you know and a person who I feel in the last 10 years or so that we have treated John with a reverence that wasn't really as publicly accessible 10 years prior. Like I think as he was getting older and it was clear that he was one of the last of the most visible figures of the civil rights movement, we hear more about John Lewis. I also think part of it is uh, the election of Obama as president put, you know, you put guys like Lewis out front a lot more because this is, you know, this is the dream, right? Like Lewis had the March on Washington, this sort of stuff. But I do not know, and I do wonder to a degree, how familiar a lot of you are with John Lewis. And I also know enough to know that when it seems like everybody knows, it can be difficult to like kind of ask questions. Um, and you may be wondering, and I just kind of want to give you guys some insight into John Lewis and why I think that so much of what you've seen in the last few days is some people faking the funk to a degree. So John Lewis is one of what was considered to be the big six civil rights figures of the early to mid 60s. Martin Luther King, C.T. Vivian, John Lewis, Whitney Young, Roy Wilkins, and A. Philip Randolph. Those were the six guys that people were talking about. And John Lewis was absolutely the youngest of those six dudes. I want to say John Lewis is like 23 speaking at the March on Think about that, man. Like 23 speaking at the March on Washington. As impressive as I think it is that King was like 25, 26, running the Montgomery bus boycott. That's still like handling business in what is effectively a small town. Can you imagine being 23 years old and standing up at that podium and speaking to all of those people like at that time? And so I want to give you a little bit of context on the March on Washington from the perspective of my parents. Just to give you an understanding, because something I don't think that people quite get about the March on Washington is at once kind of how revolutionary it was and it seemed that it could be, but also for some people, how revolutionary it was not. So my mother attended the March on Washington. She had just graduated from college. She had been heavily involved with the NAACP. My mother was the youngest, I don't know this is straight on fact, but I'm pretty sure. My mother was the youngest person to lead a sit-in movement in the United States, which she did when she was like 15, 16 years old in Oklahoma City. Um, her name is Barbara Posey. You can go look that up. My father got kicked out of college. I forget exactly what year for participating in the sit-in movements in Baton Rouge, where at the behest of the governor of Louisiana, these students at Southern University were told to pack their things and leave for that. So my mom was at the March on Washington. My dad, not only was my dad not at the March on Washington, my dad looked at the March on Washington as weak, like as a compromise. It's basically, if you had to get permits to do this, then what are we really doing here? You know, now, of course, this is the March on Washington has endured throughout history for a number of reasons. But at the time, he really viewed it as something that was not enough. Like he viewed it as asking at a time where we needed to be doing more demanding. You know, that's the way that he saw it. I feel like in the middle there is John Lewis, right? Kind of in between those two places was John Lewis. And I've been reading a lot in the last couple of days about all the editing that was done to John Lewis's speech because it was felt to be too radical in parts and too revolutionary in parts. And please keep in mind that at the March on Washington, Martin Luther King said that America has given the Negro a bad check. It's come back marked insufficient funds. Like, it's not like people everywhere else making speeches were pulling punches at the March on Washington. But John Lewis was explicitly using terms like revolution. And a lot of like the older heads that was behind it, they thought that that stuff was going too far. That was not what they wanted to hear. Like, I mean, he came out firing, firing. Like, listen to this part he says about Kennedy. And you got to remember the relationship between John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and the civil rights movement was always a little unsure because the Democratic coalition at the time often involved like wildly racist Southerners. 
But he says this in his speech. This is in the draft because they cut this part. The revolution is a serious one. Mr. Kennedy is trying to take the revolution out of the streets and put it into the courts. Listen, Mr. Kennedy. Listen, Mr. Congressman. Listen, fellow citizens. The black masses on the march for jobs and freedom. And we must say to the politician that there won't be a cooling off period. Yeah, my man came to throw fastballs in his speech at the March on Washington. And so this part was the one apparently that really, really had people nervous. And they had them, they didn't have them really like tone the rhetoric down all the way, but they did absolutely have him tone the rhetoric down. And this is what Lewis said in this draft to close the speech. He said, we won't stop now. All the forces of Eastland, Bamet, Wallace, and Thurman won't stop this revolution. The time will come when we will not confine our march into Washington. We will march through the South, through the heart of Dixie, the way Sherman did. We shall pursue our own scorched earth policy and burn Jim Crow to the ground nonviolently. We shall fragment the South into a thousand pieces and put them back together in the image of democracy. We will make the action of the past few months look petty. And I say to you, Wake up, America. Now, keep in mind that this is two years before the Bloody Sunday March in Selma. This is two years before John Lewis is beaten within an inch of his life on that bridge. Where John Lewis has his skull fractured on that bridge. That man said that this is what we was about to do, and then they went and did it. But I want you to note a very important part of this, and I think that this gets lost when people talk about so much of this. We shall fragment the South into a thousand pieces and put them back together in the image of democracy. What I want particularly white people to understand about a man like Lewis and men like King, they did this for you. Black people at that time needed to improve their condition. White people needed to improve themselves. When King was killed, Stokely Carmichael said that the great tragedy of it was Martin Luther King was the only black man that loved white people enough to try to save their souls, to try to save them for themselves, to try to make them better, to try to improve themselves. That King was the only one. But Stokely and them boys are just ready to fight. They're just like, fine. They kind of gave up on it. King was the one who believed that they could be redeemed. Lewis is saying in that part, every American ideal that you claim to love, we are here to help you achieve it. This is not just for them. This is for you. This movement did not just serve black people. This movement served America. Because the truth is, folks know they're wrong, man. You know they know they're wrong because we see so many people who feel obligated to send a rest in peace to John Lewis. They feel obligated to put a picture up on Twitter and everything else. And so many of these people are those who are responsible for taking the most important thing that John Lewis was a part of in this country, which was the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And they were the people that were behind wiping their asses with it in 2013 and gutting it and rendering it useless in effect, right? And I know the people out here, well, the Supreme Court did that. Cases like that don't get to the Supreme Court by accident. There's been a voting rights bill sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk for how long? And they ain't done nothing with it. They haven't, right? You can come out here and say, rest in peace to John Lewis. What a great man. What a brave man. But it's lip service if you're not actually following up behind it in some way. And so these people know that what John Lewis and those guys did was righteous. Not just right, but righteous. They know that what they did was noble. They know that those men and women possessed a courage that they themselves do not have. And they know that what they do and they know that what they've been doing was wrong. They fundamentally understand that and they get that. And so they'll come out and say, rest in peace to John Lewis, because they got to, right? Because they know that they've got to, because they know that ultimately the side of right prevail. But at the same time, it becomes a lot easier for these people to appreciate those folks who did that back in the day and a lot harder for them to show that respect for the people who are doing those things right now. Like the people that are out in the street marching to make things happen, the part that we don't talk about enough, if these folks sending these hollow rest in peace John Lewis messages believed it, then those people wouldn't have to be in the streets. You know, listen to this, man. This is again from 1963, the original draft of his speech at the uh, March on Washington. 
In good conscience, we cannot wholeheartedly support the administration's civil rights bill, for it is too little and too late. There's not one thing in the bill that will protect our people from police brutality. 2020, still talking about the same thing, man. Right? You say arrest in peace to John Lewis. He's saying 57 years ago, hey, man, y'all think they got to stop hitting us with them sticks? People out here getting snatched up by folks in no uniforms, in the dark, out of nowhere. But you say rest in peace to John Lewis, man. That's not really how this thing works. If you really meant that, again, these people wouldn't have to be in the streets going out here in order to try to make these things happen. And this, like Charlie Pierce wrote about it, he said that John Lewis was the bravest man that he had ever met. And there's a real argument behind it. And I think that Lewis is easier than any of these other guys to wrap their arms around because he was the most approachable, right? So like King was a prophet. Jesse Jackson was a star. John Lewis was the little brother. You know, and at every turn when you look at him, there's always a real cool kind of cuddly, like little brother quality to him. Like, look at him in the Jeezy, my president is black video. Just grinning and looking so happy to be jumping up and down at a part of the verse that's about Pimp C. Rest in peace. You know, like, like he was that guy. He's the easiest of all of those dudes to love. He was always the easiest of all of those dudes to love. But if you really love what that man did, man, then you got to stand up for it in a slightly different way. And you got to appreciate that what's going on right now is the spirit of John Lewis. Like, this is what it was. And so if you're going to get out here and be like, yeah, great man, listen to what the next generation of John Lewis is, is that's out here. Because these cats that's in the street, man, these 23-year-olds. Like, these are young people that are out here, by and large, trying to make this happen and trying to make this better. And another thing that Lewis got, and I don't want to lose sight of this because I think that this is important. What we're talking about here is going to take a while. Like what people are trying to make happen, it's not going to happen in a couple of minutes. It's not going to happen in a couple of days. It's not going to happen in a couple of weeks. Like, Gabe, you remember when everybody was so worried about how the NBA coming back was going to take attention away from what was going on in the streets? When's the last time you saw the news out there? Like, like, when's the last time that you re like really saw leading A1 on your newspaper or anything else was going on in those streets? Y'all thought the NBA was going to do that? No, man, these people were going to do it voluntarily. That's it. That's a pack line. The only time they want to turn the cameras on is when we f***ed up. Somebody go out there and burn something down, they'll put it on TV, right? But they just out there still doing it day after day after day after day after day. They don't put the camera on that. Lewis and the folks are willing to take them ass whoopers to get it on camera to put it out there because that's what it was going to take. Otherwise, people were just going to simply try to ignore them. Or in many cases, forget about trying to ignore them. They were just going to do it. But for the people that are out there, I know it's taking a long time. I know it's going to take a long time, and y'all know it's going to take a long time. Thank you for being willing to take a long time. And you think about John Lewis, again, 63 was the March on Washington, and he dies in 2020. That's 57 years. That's a hell of a long time. He's still out here trying to get people to stop beating us up, trying to get the police to stop whooping our asses. We're still trying to do that. It's going to take a long time. And what it's going to take, like for those of you who listen to this podcast, for example, you're probably going to hear me talk about these bigger things for a long time because that's how long it's going to take. It shouldn't have to take this long. And all the folks that say rest in peace to John Lewis, but made it such that this has to take so long. Why don't you do a little better by him, right? Like he was, people keep saying, well, I think it's time that they rename the Edmund Pettus Bridge after John Lewis. No disrespect to Selma, Alabama, but y'all don't think that man deserve a little more than a bridge in Selma? You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 like we can't do better than that. You, you want to show me that you mean it? And like, if you just want to talk about like a bridge, you want to show me that you mean it? Give them the Lester Maddox Bridge, that bridge from Fulton to Cobb County across the Chattahoochee River, right? You want to show me you mean it? Get that name out of here and put John Lewis's name on that. I mean, I don't know the last time you went to that part of Cobb County, but we've been going there more than we used to, right? Put his name on that one. Like, I get it, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Pettus was a former class, but I don't know who the hell Edmund Pettus is. It is anybody else, to be perfectly honest. Well, you know, well, name only come up because they beat the hell out of people on that bridge. You can get that man better than a bridge in Selma. Or, 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 you can stop trying to prevent people from voting. How about that? We know you can't be on top of all the news and information of the day. No need for the social media feeds. We got you. Now, if you haven't heard. All right, Bomani, this first story comes from education. This is Deirdre Shesgreen with USA Today. 
On July 6, the Trump administration dropped a bombshell on colleges and universities across the country, issuing a new immigration rule requiring all international students to leave the U.S. if they were only enrolled in online classes this fall. It came as the Trump administration tried to pressure all schools, including K-12, through to reopen this fall, even though new coronavirus cases are spiking across the country. The new immigration rule sparked an immediate and fierce backlash. Harvard and MIT sued the administration, followed by more than 18 state attorneys general. By last week, the administration had abandoned the new immigration policy, agreeing as part of one of the lawsuits to rescind the rule and allow international students to stay in the U.S. even if they're only taking virtual classes. There are a few reasons this caused such an uproar. First, it came as many university administrators were making careful plans about how to handle the fall semester, weighing the health and safety of students and faculty against the desire to have in-person instruction. The new rule would have upended those plans and could have forced an exodus of foreign students from the U.S. It would have also been a huge economic blow to American colleges and universities because those foreign students typically pay full tuition. There are right now about a million foreign students in the United States studying at American colleges and universities. And according to the Commerce Department, international students contributed nearly $45 billion to the U.S. economy in 2018. Major U.S. technology companies and other businesses, including Google and Facebook also fiercely opposed the Trump administration's attempted policy shift, arguing in court papers that the rule would have had serious economic consequences and impacted America's competitiveness. So here's what I find to be interesting about this. I think that there were certain people in the administration who were like, cool, this is another way that we could keep some of these immigrants out of this country, right? Like, I think there's some of those people that saw it in that way. And then the tech money was like, so, uh, you know how the tech money was treating it? Imagine if the Trump administration or any administration sent down a rule that said they were going to make it harder for black people to play basketball. It would be a march of basketball coaches on Washington, right? You want to see the spirit of John Lewis. They would all be right there. Like it's about to be a revolution and we going to burn this thing down. That's what it sounded like Facebook and them people were saying. They were like, yeah, so no people from other countries are going to be able to take these classes. And they're like, yo, but they the ones that can hoop. <laughs> like, I am not implying that anybody has any innate talent that makes them better. I am simply talking about perception. And it sounds like the tech folks were like, no, 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 we're not good enough at this stuff. We, uh, we, need, to, <laughs> we need to bring in some, we need to keep bringing in these ringers. Like, like this is, that's what's powering our situation. And somebody in the White House is like, oh, you know what? Hadn't thought of that. Good call. Yeah. You're cutting off our recruiting pipeline. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, what do you mean we can only go to the suburbs? That, but I mean, the point that Deirdre made about international students paying full tuition. I mean, think yes. about it in some states, you know, what they charge for a public university versus like a state university versus what they charge for out of state students. Right isn't as wide of a margin or if it's a private school everybody pretty much pays full tuition but like for example like i went to ucla right i didn't have to pay that much right. compared to other schools that sort of stuff i, I think i paid like less than twenty thousand mm -hmm. in tuition international tuition and out-of-state tuition over 50 grand yeah, it's like going to an Ivy League school. So it makes a huge difference for schools. Yes, that is a great point. You are right. They're they like, yo, man, we need this bread, dog. Like, they over here order it off the menu that ain't got no prices on it. The sad part about it is you can charge pretty much whatever you want because they'll pay it. Yes, well, also a big part of it was you could charge whatever you wanted before. Also, people are just taking out these damn loans. And it's just got to a point now where people are like, yo, these loans are too much. Very true. All right, this next one comes from Tech. Hi, my name is Travis Andrews. I'm a features reporter with the Washington Post, where I currently cover internet culture. There is a Facebook group uh, titled A Group Where We All Pretend to Be Ants in an Ant Colony, where two million people do just that. Someone might post, say, a picture of a watermelon and say that they need help lifting it, and thousands of people will respond uh, in all caps with the word LIFT. And that's it. It's, it's very simple. Uh, it was started by a guy named Tyrese Childs, who's home from college and was just kind of browsing the internet and found these groups where people would role play as boomers or farmers or cows and he said that those groups were uh, pretty crowded so he decided to start his own group and he chose 
ants because ants are universal. And he and his friends thought it was kind of silly and fun for a while. And then he went back to college and forgot about it. And he logged on after a few months and found that there were 10,000 people in the group. And there was a bit of consternation because someone named Aunt Kevin was trying to overthrow the queen. And, and that's, a, that's a big no-no. There, there are some pretty basic rules. Uh, the description of the group's rules say, In this group, we are ants. We worship the queen and do ant stuff. Welcome to the colony. And you just have to basically avoid human stuff. No politics. Don't employ hate speech or bullying. And remember that your name is ant hyphen your name. So I would be Aunt Travis. And always capitalize the first letters of the word the queen. Obviously. While it might seem silly, I actually spoke to uh, some some psychologists. I spoke to Erin Dupuy, who's a psychology professor at Loyola University in New Orleans, and she said that belonging to a group of any type can actually make us feel better, as something called social identity theory, and that pretending to be an ant for a little bit, especially during such a you know difficult year, might actually give us a little boost of serotonin. And indeed, since the pandemic uh, began, the group has seen such a vast rise in membership. Uh, as I mentioned, it's now at about 2 million people just pretending to be ants. Gabe, correct me if I'm wrong here. If that man said the group was started by a dude named Tyrese. Yes, he did. That is the biggest stunner of all of this. You might not be able to overthrow the queen, but I guarantee you, Tyrese, They'll overthrow you. Let me just rewind back just to make sure here. It was started by a guy named Tyrese Childs. Here's what I want to know. I would love to know what happens when Tyrese Childs goes and tells his daddy <laughs> about this. Yeah, Ty T-Y-R-E-S-E. -E. Yeah, I can't wait till Tyrese goes and tells his daddy, like, yo, I, yo, I got my ant colony got two million people in it. Uh, you, got, you brought ants in the house. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Tyrese in there trying to holler at him. You know what I'm saying? Like Tyrese started this whole thing and it's got two million people. Tyrese in it, boy. I guarantee you, Tyrese in it all kind of messages. All right, this last story comes from the Fed. This is Trone Dowd reporting for Vice News. A recent study conducted by the Urban Institute concludes that on average, poor, black, and brown Americans receive their coronavirus stimulus checks later than their white and more affluent counterparts. According to the study, three quarters of white Americans say that they received their government-issued one-time payment of $1,200 by late May. Only 69% of Black Americans and 64% of Hispanic Americans say they got their money at around the same time. The study also says that just 59% of Americans living in poverty receive their checks on schedule. Meanwhile, 73% of households living 100% above the federal poverty line say they got their checks on time. These numbers are especially alarming considering those hardest hit by the economic impact of COVID-19 are primarily families and people of color. While white unemployment fell just 1.1% in the first month of the pandemic, black unemployment fell 1.6%, Asian unemployment fell 1.7%, and Hispanic unemployment fell 2.1%. The study concludes that a number of factors play a part in the racial and economic disparity. These include a lack of access to financial amenities like bank accounts and communities of color, as well as the lack of access to the internet, which likely cut off Americans living in poorer parts of the country from the IRS's online coronavirus relief portal. Despite its shortcomings, the rollout was mostly successful, at least compared to similar efforts in the past. The study says that most Americans who qualified for a check received a payment within two months. I'm just saying, damn. That, that's all I got here is damn. Damn. I can't even get damn. Neat, damn. Being poor is expensive, man. Yeah, I mean, there are so many things that come with poor access to internet that can screw your life up. You know, we were talking about students before and, you know, classes going online and stuff like that. Can you imagine trying to connect when you don't have a reliable Wi-Fi? Right. Trying to go get your stimulus check, but you can't get on the Internet. Right. And that's what it is, man. Like, I just think I think that when this all went work from home, it made me rethink some things and realize that I have to forget that not everybody's got as much Internet as I do. It's a shame, man. Hey, this is Bomani. You have reached the right time voicemail. Say whatever you want. Get creative with it. But this is your place to talk back to the show. So talk back. Peace. All right, Bomani. So I got an idea from a listener about talent shows. I thought it was kind of left field, but talent shows, the worst talent show you've ever seen, you may have been a part of, that sort of thing. But it came from a social media campaign that was going on 
from all the different ESPN talent about hype music. Yeah, I wish I hadn't done it, by the way. So basically what had happened was ESPN put together a list of what they called hype hits. And then they asked everybody to take three off the list. At least I thought it was take three off the list. The list has hundreds of songs, right? And by the way, I don't think that there were some songs on that list that were not on there when I first like was going through it. And so I just like pick three songs, right? Like I'm not looking at a top three necessarily. I'm like, okay, three songs that I like, I'll go ahead and find them. And so I did like Formation by Beyonce because that thing knocks. Like the list I had, I was like, nah, this is up there. Like this is a good one. I had Archie episode, We Ready, because of course I would. And then the other one was uh, Still Fly by the Big Timers. And all I got was ridicule, right? All I got was, oh, man, yo, because that's all y'all ever want to do. Like, I've just come to the conclusion, especially as I've gotten a little bit more visible. The bigger you get in this, the more all people want to do is really just sit around and tell you how whack they think you are, especially young people. Like, that's 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 the whole game of it. That's what they decide they want to do. And I'm like, look, man, my bosses asked me to name three songs. I named three songs, right? And anybody, of course, if you don't like what they like, then you just don't know anything. If you don't like the music that I like, then that means my takes on music are terrible. And I'm like, what are you listening to? Right? Like, it's never anybody that ever says anything. Like, yo, I write about music. I've written about music for 20. Yes, it gets on my nerves. But anyway, that's how we got here. And somebody says something about a talent show. And I don't remember what it had to do. But I know talent shows make for funny stories. So we want to hear y'all stories about talent shows. And we got a bunch of good ones. Our first one comes from Leo in Chicago. So I've seen a lot of bad talent shows in my day. But this one took the cake. It's about 20 years ago. I'm back at the, um, the college for an alumni reunion. And as part of the festivities, they did a talent show on Saturday night. Uh, so I'm sitting at the banquet table, and unbeknownst to me, my boy is participating in the talent show. So they call his name, and he starts to walk on the stage. Now, my boy is about 6'3", 245, muscles on muscles. My man eat iron. So I'm trying to figure out what he about to do on this stage. And they start playing the music. This fool is on the stage singing Jeffrey Osborne, LTD, Love Ballad. The sight of this big man juxtaposed against this love song was so much for me that I had to hide under the table <laughs> and laugh. I couldn't get enough. So he gets off the stage, he walks back to the table, and he asked me, was I laughing at him? Yeah, I couldn't lie to him because I was still laughing. But that was just the beginning. The next act was a family of seven dressed in a <laughs> zebra print outfit, singing a gospel song. The first line out of their mouths were, hey, we're the Johnson family, and we're from the west side. I couldn't even <laughs> stay for the rest of the event, man. Yo, I feel bad for the big dude singing the Jeffrey Osborne song, because did he even say he was bad? He didn't even say he was bad, to be honest. The reason I picked that one was the, oh, the zebra. hey, we're the Johnsons, and we're from the west side. <laughs> Yep, and that was enough for him. <laughs> Love Ballad is the jam, though. You familiar with that song? No, I'm Loving not. Loving you. What we have is much more than they can see. It's the jam. Yeah, let's see. Jeffrey Osborne. Uh, you can catch him at the Connecticut casinos a lot, apparently. He's from around there. He's from Rhode Island. Oh, okay. First place that's going to try and uh, get people back up in the paint would be the casinos. Yes. <laughs> yes. They clearly don't care if their customers die. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. This next one comes from AJ in D.C. To this day, I will never forget. It was my freshman year at North Carolina a and And one of my friends' homeboy, like, he was a rapper. Um, and they had a little talent show in the union. And first of all, you know, he didn't even have, he just put the CD in, like, you know, no instrumental or whatever, so he's rapping over it. But what I will never forget is the name of the song. It was called that Dookie Dookie. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like three or four of his homeboys just on stage. And the part that really had me rolling was the fact that at some point during this performance, somebody had a smoke machine and they turned it on while this man was running around in the circle screaming that Doogie Doogie at a time show <laughs> over badly mixed CD. I still laugh about it to this day. And the best part about it is like homeboy's name. Well, I don't want to say his name on here, but he shared the exact same name as 
a dude that used to sell Coke 45 on TV back in the day. Oh! I will always remember that. Yo! So that reminds me of a talent show I went to in college. And this dude, like he did it all, man. Like he had like a fly sweater. It may have been a Kooji because it was that time. He had three girls as backup singers. And I remember he came on stage and he had like Mardi Gras beads. And he started like throwing them out in the crowd. And then he started singing his song. And he did like some pelvic thing right before the song started. And I don't remember the rest of the song. I just remember the first line. Keep in mind, this is like 99 or 2000, right? Because this is, you know, anyway. I just remember the song starts and he goes, you crack under pressure like an egg in a skillet. And I don't know anything that happened after that. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was a rap for me at that point. You crack under pressure like an egg in a skillet. Man, are you, these people are writing their own lyrics? Yes. Oh, it's a good question. I think that part came easy. The rest took work. <laughs> Last one is from Natalie in Chicago. It was the 90s, and it was a high school dinner theater fundraising thing that I was forced to be in as part of the band. And I had finished the part that I was in, which was at the beginning, and I was just trying to leave. And a friend came up to me, and he was like, have you seen the other acts? And I said, no, I don't even want to be in the part I'm in. I'm not interested in anything else. And he's like, oh, there's, so you've got to see this. Come on over here. And so he drug me over to the table that his family had bought, and so we sat, we watched a couple of acts, and then the next thing I knew, these four girls that we knew get up onto the stage, and they're, they're white girls, we'll just call them convexly shaped, and <laughs> sitting there looking at them, they're, they're all wearing tight dresses which was kind of out of the ordinary. And so I was like, well, what's about to happen here? And then the music comes on, and it's never going to get it by in vogue. <laughs> and they start singing, which they weren't very good at, and they start gyrating around, and shaking hips that they didn't have, and singing the entirety of that song. And I'm sure you're pretty familiar with in vogue and how their videos went and they tried to do their best representation of a recreation of that and trying to shake it all the way down and come back up and it, it was an interesting thing to see i was just horrified and what horrified me the most was that this was being done in front of nothing but parents and teachers in a high school cafeteria and I just couldn't figure out for the life of me. It's like, whose idea was it for these <laughs> girls to try that song? And who was responsible for you know, maybe stopping that? Just how did it make it up onto the stage? So every time I hear In Vogue or hear anything about In Vogue, that's usually the first thing I think of. <laughs> All right. Now, Natalie is the one that actually prompted this whole thing. It was her tweet that sent us in this direction. and. Wow, there's so much going on in that tale that she has told. I just, I guess I got to appreciate the audacity because I don't feel like if I was a woman in that day and age, I don't feel like I look at In Vogue at all at any point and say, I can do that. In Vogue is like the most untouchable situation that there has ever been in the history of music. They were life changing. They giving us up. He can feel video. Whole lot of things started making sense to me. They hadn't made sense all the way like that before. Woo! Who radicalized these girls? It's a different time, Gabe. It's a different time. <laughs> it was the, the, the 90s. There was a lot going on. I imagine those young ladies also left and got T-shirts that said, not black, not white, human. And then once they got to college, they was, you know, I know who they was hollering at. <laughs> and I know who they didn't marry. <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. They, 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 audacity, man. Audacity. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this thing a couple times a week. My man Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Thank you to our If You Haven't Heard contributors. Thanks to Deirdre Sheshgreen of USA Today. Check out her story on the Trump administration dropping their rule, barring foreign students for taking online-only classes. Thank you to Travis Andrew of The Washington Post. Check out his story on people on Facebook pretending to be ants. And thank you to Trone Down of Vice. Check out his story about how white people seem to get their stimulus money faster than people of color. Remember, subscribe to The Right Time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app, 
Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Hello, this is your apartment. I need some favors from you. Your cat keeps rubbing against the kitchen island, and I can't return the favor. Can you give her extra pets for me? After that, could you bundle your renters and car insurance with Geico? We could save money, and it's easy to do online. And one last thing, could you leave the TV on during the day? I need to catch up on my soaps. Geico, for bundling made easy, go to geico.com today.